let's all stand, hey, let's stretch our legs for a second. It's a long time to sit and look at different people talking. Let's just close our eyes and commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you want to speak to us today and that you have something for each of us. And Lord, we just open our hearts, we open our minds, we soften our hearts, God. And we just surrender our will. And we thank you, Father, for the transforming power of the gospel in our lives. We thank you for that firm foundation that you're wanting us to build our lives on. And today, Lord, we invite you. We invite you to come and breathe on us and speak to us, no matter where we're at, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the title this morning, if you like to take notes, is When Faith and Feelings Collide. By way of establishing a little bit of an agreement before we start, I just wanted to remind you that if you try and get away from feeling emotions in your life, you'll be running forever. Because if you haven't worked out, you're human and you cannot escape your humanity. And I'm, I'm going to speak to you today not only as a Christian myself, but as a psychologist, which I've never done up here. I've only ever spoken twice in church, but Normally, I sort of put that into my work category, but I, it really does inform some of what I've done as a Christian and in talking to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people about their faith and about their emotional life and, of course, um, the Word of God, which has been my rock in my life. So let's just establish some basics here. You can't escape feelings, we're made in the image of God, and I'm going to quickly run through, there's no scriptures for this. Genesis 6, God felt regret when he made mankind. Exodus 22, 24, God felt angry. 1 Kings 3, when Solomon asked for wisdom, God felt really pleased with him. Numbers 11, 1, when the people complained, God was displeased with them. So this is not the stoic God who doesn't like us having feelings. We're made in his image and he has all of our feelings too. Psalm 104, God feels happy. He rejoices. Proverbs 6, God laughs. I love that one. God actually laughs. Matthew 14, 14, Jesus felt compassion. John 3, 16, God feels love. Jesus felt abandoned on the cross. Feelings of abandonment. And Jesus wept when Lazarus died in John eleven thirty five. Now, often as Christians, what I experience when I talk to Christian brothers and sisters, friends, they feel like they need to hide the wealth of their emotions and their experiences because somehow it reflects that they are not Christian enough if they have these human feelings. And today, one of my prayers for you is that when you leave here, you can leave that lie behind because it actually is a lie. It's actually nothing to do with trying not to be human when you're following Jesus. In fact, Psalm 34, 18 said, God draws near when we are overwhelmed. He draws near to the brokenhearted. So if it was so terrible, wouldn't God be repelled? <laughs> he actually draws near to us when we're brokenhearted. And yet we try and escape it, yeah, and often don't go to God. So we're all on the same page. We made in his image. He feels, we feel. So let's get to an important point here. What makes the difference to a Christian, an individual who swings between feeling so much all the time and being absorbed by that and then unsteadily swinging back to now I'm in faith? What makes the difference in our lives? This is what I want to share with you today. If I could just have the first slide up. And it says, correct theological understanding. <laughs> so the very foundation of our emotional life needs to be rooted in our understanding of God and it must be true. And by true, I don't mean you do you. This is my truth. I mean true according to scripture. So real faith and emotional stability must be built on our relationship with Jesus. 
And this cuts straight through the heart of one of the differences of those who I see and when I've experienced in my life being led by my feelings and being led by faith. So let's break down and talk about emotions from a real point of view (laughs) here, not just theoretically. For an example, if I'm a person who constantly struggles with disappointment, I want to be asking myself, what is the foundation of this? If we live on the level of surface inquiry, I'm feeling really disappointed. We can live around that mountain. And people live around mountains for 40, 50, 60 years. Have you ever met someone who's grieving and the grief was 30 years ago? We've all done that, haven't we? You live and you think, wow, they're still grieving. There's no problem with grief in itself, but they're actually stuck or they're stuck in disappointment. So what I want to encourage us today is to think about foundation problems, not surface feeling issues. Trying to run away from the feeling is absolutely futile. Remember we established that? We're human. We can't. But we can establish new foundations. An example would be, I'm feeling really disappointed. Do I accept? Do I accept that my God will supply all my needs? And do I apply the word of God like a balm to that part of my heart that's really been living disappointed? You know, scripture is like an oil, it's like a balm. And I find Psalms particularly really good for that. If it's anger, if I'm a person who, we all get angry, no problem with anger. But if if I'm a person who constantly lives in anger, you know, I go from zero to 20 without a, you know, hitch, I don't even realise it's coming. Have I embedded in my faith the work of forgiveness? Do I, am I forgiven? Do I know that I'm forgiven? And do I live out of that forgiveness? So when others do things to me, do I spend the next seven weeks angry? Or in that moment, can I go, hang on a minute, acknowledge the feeling, I'm angry, because that doesn't help either, not to acknowledge it. No one's saying, don't acknowledge your humanity. Jesus never said that. He said, be angry, but don't sin. So I acknowledge the feeling and then I go, but God, you've forgiven me. I've done so much wrong. In the light of the cross, I can release and I can forgive. So it's building in a different foundation rather than sort of cutting the head off things and never dealing with the foundation because then we'll finally keep recycling the same issues and thinking, why do I always feel offended? Why do I always feel rejected? Because I haven't embedded the foundation that I need to. Sadness and regret would be another example. Have I acknowledged this feeling? We need to do that. Talk to a friend, speak to a counsellor, pray about it. But when that feeling continues to rise, sadness, regret about the past. You know that feeling, I've had it, where you feel like time's running out. Anyone ever had that feeling? You think, I've wasted so many years. You know, it might be with a child. You think, oh, look, it's too late to put discipline in now. They're nine. (laughs) You know that feeling, you think. Or it's too late to get fit and healthy. It's too late. It's April. I missed the boat. I'll do it next year. I I could tell myself that lie. Do you know what I mean? Regret and sadness, the the foundation would be, I'm going to say no to my flesh, which wants to make me look backwards, when Philippians tells me to look forwards. Philippians says, run the race with perseverance, forgetting those things that are behind. But this is the choice. And, you know, I was thinking about this. You know when you're not a Christian, do you ever feel like Christians are happier, non-Christians are happier than Christians? Anyone ever felt that? I felt that. I thought... They're going to hell and they're really happy. You know that feeling? And then you're like, why are all the Christians like, oh, I'm like, this doesn't make sense to me. And many years ago, I grappled with this. And I remember thinking, when you're not a Christian, you have one enemy, just one. And he's really lovely. His name's Jesus. You're an enmity with God and he loves you and he pursues you. And you can sort of enjoy your life, yeah, on the surface. When you're a Christian, you have three enemies. You have the world, you have your flesh, and you have the devil. And that sort of made me realise, oh, 
That's why it's so much harder being a Christian. Okay. I've gone from a nice enemy to really bad. And it's sort of, and I guess in saying this, I want to remove, um, this is a bit of a tangent. I'm allowed to do that, aren't I? Tangent. Craig and I went to Shanghai about 13 years ago. Have you ever tried to cross the road in an Asian city? Yeah. yeah. Right, seriously. Like you take your life into your hands, right? But you're standing there, and I did find some amazing images. Just imagine um, animals, kids on the back of bikes, babies falling out of carts, thousands of cars, millions of people trying to cross an intersection with no road rules. They have none. And they're all going in the opposite direction. And Craig and I are standing at the side of the road. First time in Shanghai, we're like, okay. And everyone beeps. No one's listening. Everyone just beeps. And you watch the local people, and they're on their phone. They just do this, just walking. And you're thinking, oh, my God, they're going to get... And we're like this. We were screaming, trying to cross the road. And it made me think about our faith. It made me think... If, you ex- if you're a local person, you expect it to be crazy and you just walk. You certainly don't stop. You keep going. If, you're, if your expectation, like Craig and I, was that the cars will stop, <laughs> you, there's no way they're stopping. You just got to go. And it reminded me of our faith as Christians. I think sometimes we expect we become a Christian. Hallelujah. And it's the exact opposite. It really is. Like, we've got to talk about this. No one's talking about this. Salvation's fantastic. But between now and the end of time, there's three enemies. And the reality is we live daily up against that. And for me, I don't know about you, for me, the loudest one is not the devil. It's me. It's my flesh. It's my flesh. Mostly in the area of my thoughts. And that manifests in the area of my feelings. So we're all on the same page here that when we're swinging from faith to feeling, one of the reasons is because our expectation is this is meant to be easy. So today, you know in 1 Corinthians 13 it says, no foundation can any man lay than that which is Christ Jesus. And this might sound really silly, but it actually really, really means it. I want you to think about that scripture. No foundation can any person lay. Anything else you try and put as your foundation in your life, you cannot build on it. You can try. You can spend 20 years building your life on doing something good for God. It won't work. You can spend years being an amazing parent and thinking, I've done it. I tried that doesn't work because the kids will always find a way. (laughs) And we've got flesh, yeah? Being liked by people. You can try and build your life and your sense of um, poise almost before God and say, I've got a decent life. I'm a good person. But none of this is the foundation that Christ tells us to build our life on. So if emotional peace and stability is your um, security in God, As soon as something comes against your emotional peace or stability, you'll have a faith crisis. So today, what I'm wanting you to think about is what are the patterns, what are the one, usually there's one or two for all of us. None of, most of us are like the rest of us. It's usually insecurity, people pleasing, but not that interesting. (sighs) Do you know what I mean? We're all, we think we're so unique. And then you talk to five people and you go, are you insecure too? I didn't know that. It's like we're all the same, yeah? But if this is your foundation, how you'll know it's your foundation is if you keep tripping up on it. I'll say that again. If the fruit is constantly, I don't feel like I don't belong, I don't feel like I belong, or I feel insecure, I don't know what I want to do with my life, that's telling you there's a root that says, once I've got this right, I'll be good. And that's not what Scripture says. It says, no foundation can you lay. So today I want to encourage you to make sure the foundation is Christ and his word. Matthew 24, 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So it helps us get really intentional, doesn't it, about building 
our friendships, our relationships, our emotional health on the Word of God. Because when you get to the end of your life, nothing that is not of Him will remain. That, to me, makes me go, oh, that's flesh, leave that. I can literally see myself going through my day worrying about something so ridiculous with my children and then I go, it's going to burn up. Okay. It's like a filter for me now. I literally go, this person's really annoying me. I'm going to, hang on a minute, going to burn up. Whoop, whoop, gone. What are you saying, Lord? What are you saying, Lord? <laughs> pray. Usually it's pray. Pray about it. Get the mind of Christ on it. Oh, but Craig's done this. Love you, babe. Craig's done this. I'm going to go and have this conversation. No, whoop, going to go up in, into flames. Unless it's of him. Do you know what I mean? It, it's like a really quick way to sort out how to deal with our emotional responses in life. Another thing that makes a difference is trusting God through pivotal circumstances. If you can put that slide up. Trusting through pivotal circumstances. So often we think, you know, someone has a baby, buy a new house, get married. All of these type of circumstances can be positive or they can be negative ones. Really terrible things that happen to people. People having health crisis, financial ruin. But in these moments, I find if I'm walking in obedience, there's a rest when I fully accept Jesus is Lord over my whole life, no matter what happens. So literally all hell can be breaking loose. But when I have that foundation that I trust God in this pivotal circumstance, so Craig and I are going through one right now. You won't mind me sharing a little bit. We are, we've run a business for 20-something years and there's a dodgy person involved who's trying to take the business. And after 20 years and a legacy of Craig and his dad, that's really painful. And I want to get my bazooka and shoot them all and the feelings, like I've cried, I've driven in my car. I think I rang Mike one day. It's like, I can't even talk, I'm just crying. I'm so all of that's okay. But within about 24 hours, I got to the point of my foundation. Oh, Jesus is CEO of our business. No one can steal from God. We're good. Let's move on. Honestly, that was, that's the foundation rather than like falling apart. So tapping into the truth. But if, you, if you're not in the word, it'd be really hard to find that. Yeah? That's not, that's not condemnation. If you're, not, if you're a new Christian, you get around other people and they, they speak that into you. But if you're a, you know, a seasoned Christian and you're not in the Word, you won't have anything to draw on. So that's really important. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers in our pleasures and he shouts in our pain. I love that. There's a preacher called um, Greg Laurie. Some of you may know of him. And he said, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. And he said that after his son died in a, car, in a car crash. How's that? Like, that's when you know what you believe, eh? Yeah. So I want to look at um, the life of Peter today with you. Love Peter. Peter who mouths off and cuts off ears. And, you know, Peter is just so human. I love him. Passionate, yes, Peter. We're going to look at two situations. I'll describe the first one to you which is found in Luke 22. Jesus tells Peter, your faith is about to be tested in a really big way, Peter. Don't you love that? Jesus can see the crisis coming. Challenges our theology a bit, doesn't it? He can see it coming and he says to Peter, warning, your faith's going to be tested. (laughs) He didn't stop it either. We know in James it says the testing of our faith produces perseverance. Damn it, I hate that scripture. You know, leave it alone. Why do I have to go through? Oh, James, okay, right. Produces perseverance and then when you've done good, you know, don't give up. You'll have a great reward. There's reasons why, yeah? But um, Jesus says, your faith's about to be tested. And he even says to Peter, which 
we're not going to go down this tangent. I might give that to Pastor Jason for a really in-depth sermon. Jesus prays for Peter and his faith still fails. Like that. Jesus said, I'm going to pray for you that your faith might not fail. And what happens? His faith fails. I was like, I have a problem with this theologically. Move on. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Maybe he didn't pray. He said I was going to pray for you and he didn't lie. So anyway, excuse the tangent. Um, Jesus saw the crisis coming and he sees them coming in our lives too. And he says, (laughs) Jesus tells him, you're going to deny me. And not only that, you're going to do it three times. Woo! Woo! So let's pick up Peter's response. If I can have a slide for Luke 22, verse 33. Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. Don't you love that? Jesus, the son of God, has told him, I'm going to pray for you. You're about to be tested. No, he's so offended. Lord, I'm ready. I'm so ready for this. Have you ever been like that? You think, God, I'm so ready. And the next day you're like, am I a Christian? <laughs> am I even saved? <laughs> for me with worship, it's often like, I can't sing, I can't play the piano, I just can't do it. You know, just, <laughs> am I ready? I'm ready. I'll even go to prison, I'll get locked up with you. Let's see, Peter, what happens. His faith hadn't been tested like this before, and he wasn't ready. A young girl, just a few verses later, in Luke twenty-two fifty-six, <laughs> a servant girl. She's about thirteen, so no one, no one threatening, you know, notices him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, "This man was one of Jesus' followers," but Peter denied it. He just said he's ready, and he denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. (laughs) I don't even know him. Three times he denies him. His faith under pressure failed. And I love Jesus. You read on later and he restores him. Jesus restores Peter. Situation two, Peter again. In Acts chapter three, Peter and John, you know the story, are at the gate. Beautiful. They're, they walk past the man that everyone in the town knows has never walked. It's very well known, this man. He's begging for money. And after their brief encounter, Peter heals this guy. The man follows them, jumping and screaming. I can imagine part of Peter might have been thinking, Shh, I've just healed you. This is Peter who's just denied Jesus, right? But people know this man. And soon Peter and John are thrown in jail for the night in Acts 4.3. And the next morning, Peter is standing in front of the high priest. Now, these are the very men in Acts, we read this, the very men, it even names them, that actually crucified Jesus. That would be emotions colliding with faith, wouldn't it? My Lord has just been crucified. He's looking into the eyes of the ones who just crucified Jesus. And they're about to question him. Peter, who denies Jesus, about to question him. But this time his faith stands. So how is that? His leader's gone. They want him gone. Anyone associated with Jesus, they want gone. We know soon after that Stephen gets beheaded, he doesn't even get the opportunity to come before the leaders. They just behead him. So it's pretty much open season, let's kill the Christians. And Peter's got this pop quiz, round two, coming up for him in front of these guys. We can have the slide up for Acts 4, 7. And it went something like this, these leaders. They brought in the two disciples and demanded by what power... Or in whose name have you done this? Next slide. This is Peter's response. Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, 
the, just, just in case you thought it was another Jesus, he says, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name unto heaven by which we must be saved. Peter passes this test with flying colours. His faith previously denied and, and tested and failed. A few chapters later, Jesus is gone. He's faced, facing the killers of Jesus and he has a chance. All he has to do is just deny. This is a very familiar feeling to Peter. A bit of deja vu. Been here before. He could just go, oh, who? No, no. No, we didn't heal. I don't know. We just, something happened and I just healed. Don't know, don't know why, don't know how. But he's ready. His faith's been tested and he's ready. He would have feelings like we do. Running rampant. Fear. Insecurity. I mean, his life's on the line. None of us have really got to that point. Peter looked into the eyes of the men and it says before this verse, filled with the Holy Spirit. I love that. That's a real clue for us, hey, that when we're wanting to stand and rise above feelings and when our faith is being tested, doing it in your own strength, you're probably going to fall flat on your face. You might do it for a bit, but you'll still be around that mountain. When it's spirit-led, when Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says to them, rulers and elders, let me clearly state, there's an, there's an anointing in him, and he's doing it from that point of view. It's still Peter. We don't change that much in two weeks or seven weeks. We don't change that much. None of us do. He's still Peter, but he's tapped into a foundation that is different. And it even says, it's beautiful in Acts 4.12. Um, I haven't got this up here, I don't think. The members of the council recognised that these men had been with Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? There was something about them. So in three quick points to finish, to summarise this, what makes the difference to why some people's faith might be undermined when they collide with emotions, and why some people manage to just be a bit more steady and on a trajectory forward. And I do want to say, you know, um, trauma happens in life, and that requires intentional, focused help and therapy and work. It really does. Trauma is not something you can just, through your mind, get over. We're talking about patterns and habits of being and mind that are more daily, everyday things, yeah, um, that we can embed the word of God in and we will see change but it has to be consistent yeah, it can't be like I did it on Sunday and then next Sunday I do it again and then next Sunday which is what most of us get in the habit of doing so three quick points to finish put the slide up for me um, what makes a difference what we believe who we listen to and how we frame it so what we believe we've talked about Coming back to faith eventually is not how we want to live. Deviating a lot with emotions is not how we want to live. We want to live with the foundation, like when Peter accessed that anointing, we want to live in that place. Who we listen to. Having right people around your life is a real key. When we have faith that can exist in the tension, we have people in our life who can contextualise it for us. People who are isolated don't tend to have this. They have what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and it's a really dangerous place to be because they live out of that. So if you find yourself isolating, I, I literally have to, when I'm going through a hard time, I want to lay in my bed under my covers and never come back to church and talk to Christians again and hear someone preach me a scripture. I don't want to, I don't, my flesh doesn't want that. But what I choose to do is get your boots on, get yourself into church, get to the prayer meeting when you're feeling the worst, get to the prayer meeting, make the phone call with a friend who you know will speak truth into your heart, pick up the phone, ring Mike, because I'm like feeling really low, ring someone who you know is going to speak truth, say, can you pray for me? 
I think I've rung Inga recently, just <laughs> pray for me. Well, I still need to pray. And then, like, it's, so it's a choice. I still have all the feelings. Peter still had all his feelings. You can't tell me he was standing in front of the murderers and going, I've got this. He would have been shaking in his boots, shaking in his boots, but he chose. So who we listen to, I'll give you an example of this. Um, you pop the scripture up for me, Pian, and I'm John chapter 9, verse 3. Um, maybe I didn't give that to you. I didn't give that to you. But basically, the disciples say to Jesus, who sinned? There's a blind man. And they're like, come on, was it their father? Who sinned? Why has this guy got this problem in his life? It's fascinating. And Jesus is able to contextualise that whole circumstance, one, because they asked him, but two, he's able to speak truth. He corrects their misunderstanding. And he said, no one sinned. He tells them why. No one sinned. And in our life, when we're struggling, we need a Jesus. We need a who, a person in the community of faith to speak into our lives and bring context to why we're going through things. Better question how we can get through it. How did you get through it? So we need to listen to people. The word of God, of course, as I said before, in our hearts is the first thing. And number three was how we frame it. So I just want to give you a, a really quick example of a new way to frame when you're experiencing emotional pain that is a pattern in your life. A new way to frame it is not to try and understand at the level of the emotions. A new way to frame it might be this. Help me to see you, God, in this. I know you're my Lord. Reframe this for me. Where is your hand in this, God? This really hurts. This season's really hard. I can't see any evidence of you right now, God, but where are you? Show me where you are. I trust you. You know, church, I think we are much more like clay on a wheel being constantly moulded than a finished product on a shelf. And I think it will really help us in our faith walk to understand that as we're growing and transforming our heart and our lives, becoming more Christ-like, bringing our emotions and our will under submission to the Word of God, it's not you arrive, it's that process of mould me God, make me, I'm still human and he doesn't hold that against us. There's no guilt. You know, we often get upset about being upset. You ever felt like that? I'm really depressed because I'm depressed. We get, we spiral. I'm so sick and tired of being tired. It's like, okay. Versus, God, you know my frailty, I'm human. What foundation? What foundation do you want to build in, in this space? It might just be one thing for you, one pattern reframing it. God, I know you're here. You haven't abandoned me. Your word says you're near to the brokenhearted. I'm not going to waste time thinking about why I feel like I'm sinking when I've got you in the boat with me. You're in the boat. You know, I remember a time when God helped me reframe something in my life. Most of you would know... Um, my mum committed suicide. And to say that I needed to reframe is a big understatement. <laughs> the rejection was so deep. But, you know, running to the word of God and pouring over the Psalms and speaking to trusted people, getting around people who could sow into my life, allowing the feelings, naming them, journaling them, yelling at God, all of that. What began to be revealed as I reframed it was truth. And who would have thought out of such a tragedy that truth, well, if you read the word, it says all things work together for good. And literally, out of this tragedy, I embedded into my heart, Psalm 27, verse 10, even when my parents forsake me, he's with me. No one can take that from me. That's a foundation for my life, that what the enemy meant for evil, God turned to good. 
and embedded that into me. So as we finish up, I encourage you to, if you don't know Jesus, to get to know the real Jesus, the one who says that he walks in the valley with you. He's not afar off and he's not saying you shouldn't be feeling that. You're a Christian. He actually knows the world, the flesh and the devil are against us. He's in the boat. He's not afar off. He's Emmanuel, God with us. And just encourage you to allow Jesus to reframe your emotional foundation so that you're not up and down and wondering why all the, all the non-Christians are having a happy life and you're not. It's, it, <laughs> they're deceived. They have no idea. And you have a saviour who one day, the perfecter, the author and perfecter of your faith, will make all things new. But this journey on the way, he wants to walk with you. He wants you to partner with him, working out your salvation. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on yourself. Okay? He loves you. Amen?